Hey, what's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Today we're gonna run through a mock draft on ESPN. I haven't done a mock draft on on ESPN, and I don't know if I've even done one this summer. Probably because it sucks. I figure I mix it up a little bit. This is a ten-team league PPR. I'm doing it from the fifth spot again, and I know I did this a couple videos ago. The same thing. The reason I'm doing it again is because my big money league. This is exactly how it's set up. It's ten teams. I got the fifth spot. It's 0.5 PPR, but we also do 0.5 per first down. So it's almost close to PPR. And I've been doing a lot of mocks lately. And how I thought I was going to start off the draft, it's changing really quickly. It's changing pretty drastically as compared to how I thought it was going to go. So I kind of wanted to give you guys an insight onto the strategy that I'm getting into because it might be very different than what I've been saying kind of all summer. I was in negotiations with the dude who had the first pick to try to, to try to swap picks, but I fucked that up. It was like this episode of Game of Thrones this week when they go over to where Cersei and, and Jamie Lannister are and, and they fuck up that negotiation real bad. That was me, except I didn't have Tyrion to dwarf his way into the first overall pick. So now I'm just left here with the fifth pick again, which is kind of shitty because they had the big five, Johnson, Bell, Brown, Julio, Beckham. We don't know the status of Odell right now with the ankle. They're saying it's getting better day to day. I just have no idea how it's going to be when the season actually rolls around. My draft is on Labor Day Monday. So a lot of you guys, I'm so sorry. I hate when the text pop up during these videos. A lot of you guys ask when my draft is. It is Labor Day Monday. So the video of that, I do a live draft, a whole vlog of the whole day and everything. I, I know that gets a lot of positive feedback. Y'all mess with that. So that'll be Monday. It'll be out either Tuesday or Wednesday right afterwards. <laughs> that shit is so annoying. All right. So this is my strategy right now. With the fifth pick, I'm still going with Odell or Julio. Hopefully Julio drops me to five, but... I'm still going with Odell. McCoy is just going way too high for me. I will not even debate that. If I don't go Odell at five, it's AJ Green, not Michelle McCoy. But that that's the obvious pick. The first round pick is easy for me, right? I get whatever one of the big five kind of falls into my laps. <laughs> All right, so Odell's on the board for me. And that's, you know, that's who I'm going to go with. I think the upside is just way too good. He's been too consistent. Every There's no downside really to him besides this little ankle thing. So if he's ready to roll, I feel like we'll, I'll have a pretty good idea by the time my draft actually comes around in a week from today. So I'll, I'll know whether or not I could really take him. You know, I will say if he misses week one, I'll definitely think about taking AJ Green over. Wow. Okay. Robert Gronkowski just went seven. And that was who I was thinking of going with in the second round. So I guess I can't really go through my spiel there. Now I know in Yahoo drafts, he's ranked like 33rd. So he keeps going off the board in like the third round. My thing with Gronk is this. I'm never really one to take the tight end early, but this year has been different for me. I want one of those top tight ends. It's like one of the top six or seven. So if it ain't Gronk, I love Kelsey. I love Greg Olson. I love Jordan Reed. I think every single one of them is basically going at value or going for a value where they're getting picked in drafts. For whatever reason, Gronkowski's been going in the top 10 for the last like five years. This year, the fantasy community just decided that we're going to finally bake his injury history into his ADP. So this is the first time I've seen Gronk go before like pick 18. It just so happens to be the draft that I want to show you guys that I'm going to fucking take Gronk 16th overall. Whatever, we'll work through it. Got to improvise over here at Big Dogs. So what I'm saying is, you know, Gronk gives you such an advantage over every other player at tight end in fantasy football. So with this Edelman injury, I know everyone just keeps arguing about, is it going to be Chris Hogan that's going to eat? Is it going to be Brandon Cooks that's going to eat? Is it going to be Danny Amendola? I'm like, no, yo, the Patriots use their best players to their best ability. And of course, they're going to use more two tight end sets, get Dwayne Allen more involved. I'm sure they'll put some of their running backs out wide and let them catch passes Hogan, Edel, uh, Amendola, all those guys are going to see an uptick in targets. I think the biggest boost is going to be to Gronkowski. All right, my second round pick. Now, I would have taken Gronk here, so I guess this is going to switch things up. For me, this is a no-brainer. I'm going to Marco Murray. I don't expect him to fall to me in my actual draft. What I was going to say is that due to the recent injuries that have been happening in the NFL, I found myself going with a lot of Odell and then Gronk as my second round pick because like, uh, with Edelman out, I think Gronk is going to absolutely eat. He's been fully healthy this whole offseason. No, not even a single like negative report about him. And then the third round, I've been taking Kareem Hunt at the 25 spot if like a, an Amari Cooper or uh, you know Doug Baldwin doesn't fall to me there. I go with Kareem Hunt right now. Like right, I probably wouldn't even have to because I I feel like they probably. 
I don't think they've updated their rankings, so I don't know where Kareem Hunt is right now. Like, this is, yo, this is, like, such bullshit. Kareem Hunt, 38. Yeah, I will gladly take him in the third round. Fourth round, of course, if he's there, but I don't expect him to be in real competitive drafts. So I'm more than happy taking Kareem Hunt over any of the running backs or wide receivers available right here. He has easily and arguably the same floor as all these other guys. The team absolutely loves him. Spencer Ware is out for the year, so he's going to get more than his fair share of opportunity. At worst, Charkandrick West is going to eat into some third down work, but Kareem Hunt was an easy three down back in college. Crazy production in college. When you watch him, he passes the eye test. For me, Kareem Hunt is an easy third round pick. Fournette has that foot injury that he's dealing with that he's always dealt with throughout LSU. I don't think that team is any good. I don't think he's going to get a lot of scoring opportunities. I think he's a year away from being an elite pick there. Kareem Hunt for me is the easiest uh, fantasy rookie running back this year. I think he easily finishes the top of the list. And you look at the rest of the wide receivers. There's no one that I like more than Kareem Hunt here. Demarius Thomas, sure he's been consistent. A thousand yards. That's not really what I'm looking for in my third round pick. Kareem Hunt has that 13, 1400 yard upside. Demarius Thomas on a week to week basis, on a, on a points per game basis. Demarius Thomas has never actually, the last few years at least, not Peyton Manning wise, is like wide receiver 18 to wide receiver 20. He's more of a low end wide receiver two than, you know, the high end wide receiver two that he gets drafted at nowadays. So I'm off Thomas. Pryor, I mean, I still love Pryor. I just think that where he's going right now is just way too early. I loved him as a value play when the, when the summer first came around because he was going in like the fifth, sixth round. But I am a little concerned about how the Washington offense ran or how, I guess, just a lack of success that Pryor had in the off, in the, uh, in the preseason, he really didn't show anything to me. So it scares me a little bit, but I'm not, if he falls to me in like the late fourth, fifth round, I'm okay taking him there. But you look at all the other running backs. I, I think Kareem Hunt really has the best combination of ceiling and floor. So for the most part, I've been saying that you want to come out of the first three rounds with a minimum of one running back. And I just didn't think for me, it would come by way of wide receiver first, tight end second, and Kareem Hunt third. But that's this is like the start I've been finding myself going with a lot in my mock drafts. I'd be ecstatic if DeMarco fell to me, but my big money league is a keeper league. So I know Jordan Howard is already being kept for like a 12th round. Michael Thomas is also off the board for a ninth or 10th. Same with Isaiah Crowell. So a lot of these early picks are going to be going three spots earlier than they should be. So I don't expect one of the top tier running backs to fall to me at pick 16 in the second round, unfortunately. Where are we at? I haven't even looked at the board. So fourth round, Lamar Miller, I still really like at running back too. Here in the fourth, I've seen him drop to the fourth round in a lot of mocks lately, and I am perfectly fine taking him here. I also love what I've seen out of Keenan Allen. So far throughout the preseason, he looks like that stud that's going to be an absolute monster in PPR. Looks like he's nothing. He hasn't lost anything off his step. And you're getting him for, you know, around two rounds later than you've been able to get him for the last two years. So I'm perfectly fine with him at this value. And I think I'm going to grab him here. I absolutely love the start that I have here. DeMarco, Kareem Hunt, OBJ, and Keenan Allen. I'm keeping Drew Brees for a ninth round pick. This is, we play in a six point passing touchdown league, as well as uh, 20 yards as a point instead of 25. So the quarterback gets a little bit of an upgrade there in my league. So I'm, I'm pretty happy to get Brees in the ninth round. I'm also keeping Danny Woodhead for like a 12th round. I was super pumped up about that a few weeks ago, but now this little injury that he's dealing with is kind of scaring me as well. I mean, the big, the biggest scare for me is the fact that Joe Flacco is still not back on the fucking field yet. I don't know what he's doing, but if Flacco is not in that lineup, he's not a great quarterback by any means, but the fall off from him to like Ryan Mallett is going to be devastating to that offense. And I wouldn't feel comfortable starting a single player in that offense if Joe Flacco is not in the lineup. And that goes... That's the same thing probably with the Colts too. Maybe outside of T.Y. Hilton as a flex or a wide receiver three. If Andrew Luck's out there, I can't play Frank Gore. I can't play Dante Moncrief. I can't play Jack Doyle. I can't play anyone in that offense outside of T.Y. as a three or a flex. So same thing goes here in Baltimore. They're like a poor man's version of the indie offense right now. So I get to keep Woodhead and I get to keep Breeze. But Woodhead's not looking as good as I thought it was going to be. We're getting to the fifth round. Well, we heard the rumors of, uh, oh, Bilal Powell's getting kept too in my league, which I'm pissed about because I really, really, really want to target him we're hearing the rumors of matt forte oh no they took fits we're hearing the rumors of matt forte being picked i'll get back to that in a second still a lot of talent on the board in the fifth round here i'm pretty far off a of d hop as well as alan robinson but i i really liked him in the fifth round so it's going to be hard for me to pass up on them here i really like Tariq hill as well joe mixon in the fifth joe mixon i i have very much slowed down the hype train on mixon because of what we've seen this preseason we'll probably go with Allen Robinson. For me, I know a, d a big debate between people is probably 
DeAndre Hopkins versus Allen Robinson. I have Allen Robinson ranked ahead of Hopkins. So I would take Robinson over Hopkins in this type of league simply because he was so good two years ago and he was so bad last year. And a lot of that had to do with how Blake Bortles was very good two years ago in terms of deep ball accuracy. Last year, you guys got to go look. If you haven't uh, seen my Jacksonville Jaguars outlook video, I go super in depth on Allen Robinson and Blake Bortles and that whole situation and why I think they fell off last year. It was a ridiculous drop off in terms of Blake Bortles accuracy percentage on deep balls. And it, it's almost to the point where it's, it was so bad that it has to improve and it has to be positive regression this year. And he's been bad this, this preseason too, but I do think that maybe this little quarterback battle kind of sparked something in him because the coach is saying that he's he's looked a lot better in practice this last week and he he looked better than Henny in the game in their last preseason game so if I had to choose between one of them I'm going out Robinson there I would even have debated Jordan Reed as a second tight end the Washington offense just runs way 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 more smoothly when Reed's in the lineup and he offers such high upside because he has great chemistry with Kirk Cousins there so in the fifth round when you really still haven't rounded out your starting lineup right you're still getting flex guys you're still going based off best player available I find myself in the fifth round getting a ton of shares of some kind of wide receiver or some kind of tight end i think out of probably like the 60 mock drafts i've done this summer Larry Fitz has been my fifth round pick in 95% of them. So I absolutely love Fitz. Someone actually snagged him a pick before I could in this mock draft. I'm a little upset about it. Y'all can't see me on camera, but I got the tissues out. Now in this next pick, in my league, we play two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end, and two flexes. So realistically, I'm still able to pick anyone on the board and they could be my number two flex guy. So that's how I do these mock drafts. You should always mock based on how your league goes. And what I'm seeing on the board right now, I don't really see any value at running back. Uh, I don't, you know, I like Ingram. I don't like his upside at all. I have no shares of Watkins really, but I think I think I like Watkins right now. Him and Goff really haven't showed anything together. I think he's still getting acclimated to the playbook. But I know his first his first week matchup, they get the Colts and Vontae Davis has a pretty serious leg injury. I think it was a groin injury or something. And Vontae Davis is he's a really, really good cornerback, and he's probably the only good like defensive back the Colts have on their team right now, or at least a cornerback. So Sammy has a really nice matchup week one. That's a, probably a little bit of a tiebreaker for me. So that would fill out kind of my starting guys, right? My my running backs, my wide receivers. Now, I'd still be drafting based on best player available at this point. I'm not rushing to take a tight end. I'm not rushing to take a QB. But I do really, really, really want one of the top tight ends this year. Gronk, Kelsey, Olsen, Reed, Jimmy Graham, Tyler Eifert. It's those six guys. I want one of those six guys. Eifert is the last one on that list because, you know, he's still not... They just came out and said he's dealing with something else, like in his knee, like tendonitis or something. So he's dropped to the last of that tier. I wouldn't hate him as my starting tight end, but I would prefer the other guys. And I'll take Jimmy Graham in the seventh round. Him and Wilson have looked really good together this this preseason. I'm in the group of people that expects Russell Wilson to have an absolute bounce back year. He was like quarterback three or four in fantasy two years ago, and the ankle injury that he had last year affected him for like nine games so he was not himself this preseason he's looked incredible and i'm expecting that to just absolutely pour into baldwin's numbers to jimmy graham's numbers one of the running backs in the seattle backfield will have a monster year and that's a strategy that i'm going to get to at some point in this draft because i have a strategy that i want to nail the seattle backfield with for now we're still going to draft based on value though and i have my eye on Devonte parker right now big time i pretty much hit it right on the head when jay called over with miami i put out a video that day and i said Devontae Parker gets a big boost because Jay Cutler's got that just like fuck it and chuck it kind of attitude. And he's going to see a ton of those targets on the outside because, you know, you look back at Cutler, it was the same thing with Alshon Jeffrey with Brandon Marshall and with Martellus Bennett. He uses the big outside guys and you're seeing that a ton with Devontae Parker, Kenny Stills, Julius Thomas. And I said Jarvis Landry is going to have a huge fall off because he never used his slot receivers. Earl Bennett was like the best slot receiver he had five years ago and he put up like 300 receiving yards. And it's exactly what we've seen this preseason. Parker looks like an animal them two have a great connection and cutler is not afraid to chuck him the ball and there goes Paca. so parker's off the board next guy i have my eye on is adrian peterson and a lot of that has to do with the fact that my league is 0.5 ppr but it's also 0.5 per first down so while ingram probably has the upper hand in ppr leagues on peterson i actually do kind of expect peterson to 
to get a little share of of receiving work in that backfield i don't really know why it's just a gut feeling i have but of course they're probably going to use peterson a lot on short yardage situations so that's that's big for me every first down he gets is another half a point for myself as well as you know i think he's going to be the goal line back there that's an offense that runs so smoothly and they have so many scoring opportunities you know they score 25 30 35 points a game so you give peterson those goal line opportunities and you're putting someone on my team that i'm i would not be surprised at all if Peterson ended up with somewhere between nine to 11 rushing touchdowns this year. So for me, while Peterson, I don't know, maybe he has some risk, you know, maybe the volume on a week to week basis isn't exactly there. I really like what he could offer you. So I think I'm putting together a pretty solid squad so far. I would definitely be happy with this in my, in my league. When I'm getting to these later rounds, right? You have the, I, I'm not touching any of these top two guys. Paul Perkins to me, someone, uh, someone asked me on YouTube today, what is my opinion of Paul Perkins? I think he is an absolute poor man's Amir Abdullah in a much worse situation. He's not going to get the receiving workload because he has Shane Vereen there. I don't think he's going to get the goal line work with Orleans Darkwa there or even Gallman there, the rookie. They're in a passing offense that does not run the ball a ton. They they don't have a proven track record of, of having successful running backs. And he's not even really a lock. He doesn't have a stranglehold on those early down runs. So like Paul Perkins is so far off my radar for where he's probably going to get drafted. Riddick for me as well. I'm high on Abdullah, so I have to be pretty much low on Riddick. To me, week to week, Riddick is not safe to put in your lineup at all. And now that Abdullah's looked incredible throughout the preseason, he's going to get a ton of receiving work and Riddick's off my radar. So right now I'd probably be looking at, I saw Doug Martin just go off the board. He would have been someone I'd probably be targeting at this point. So in my league, we had the setting set to anyone picked in the 10th round or later can be kept the following year and you can keep up to two keepers. So if you hit on two guys, maybe say the 11th round and the 13th round, and they're at your, they're on your roster at the end of the year, you're gonna be able to keep them the next year. You just have to lose the round in front of whatever round you pick them. In. So this year we actually changed the keeper rule. We changed it so that we moved the round up from 10 to 8 i'll explain this pick in a sec from 10 to 8 and you're only allowed to keep one guy the following year because you know we didn't want to uh, for us like the best the best night of all the entire season is is draft night it's mad fun for us we you know we do the live draft as you'll see you'll see on camera in in a week or two when i put it up it's a really fun night so you know, if we start putting three, four keepers up like that, that eliminates a lot of guys you could draft and it just doesn't really make the draft night that fun. So we kind of eliminated two keepers, knocked it down to one. So Rawls, anyways, if you watched my top five, uh, late round running back guys, Rawls is up there for me. He already earned his way into the starting role prior to the little injury that he's dealing with right now. I'm assuming he's good to go when I mean, he's going to be a top that depth chart. And if you want to say Chris Carson, that's where the rest of my strategy kind of comes into play. I'll get back to that in a second. So Oh, that was my ninth round pick, wasn't it? So I'm keeping Drew Brees in the 10th round. So I lose my ninth round pick this year. So I'm just going to take a quarterback to kind of make it similar to exactly how, how the draft will go for me this year. So I'll take whoever's left here. I'll take luck because I have a little explanation. I want to talk about luck for a second. And I got fucking, I got facts on facts on facts for every player. You want to hit me with any player? I'll give you the a quick synopsis. Andrew Luck. I'm scared shitless of Andrew Luck. I'm scared shitless of that Colts offense. But if you take Luck, do not reach on Luck. Don't think you're being cute taking him in the 7th or 8th round, especially in a 10 or 12 team league. There's no reason to carry that risk with so much so many other quarterbacks that will put up fine numbers. If he drops like right here where I got him in the 10th or 11th round, totally okay grabbing luck because on a points per game basis when he does finally return he'll be a great starter for you but i will say if you grab luck you can grab carson palmer late because palmer while he's not you know i, I don't want him for the entire year he starts off with great matchups detroit and then indy indianapolis so his first two games are against terrible pass defenses so you could weather the storm for luck and i'm assuming by week three if not earlier he hasn't even been ruled out for week one, realistically, but all points, all, all signs point to that. If Luck's out, you know, I'm assuming he'll be back week three, then you don't really need Palmer anymore. But you have two juicy matchups prior to that that you can weather because you'll be able to draft Palmer late, late in drafts. So that's my deal with Luck. As I was saying with Thomas Rawls, there are two guys that, that are actually three guys. None of them are fat fucking Eddie Lacy. Okay, what do we got? Now we're just looking for depth. Tyrell is my fudging boy. I will grab Tyrell till I die this year. I love Tyrell Williams. He is one of my top sleepers. He's been in all my sleeper videos pretty much. I don't want to get too in-depth on him because I want to talk about my boy Rolls-Royce. We ride in the Rolls-Royce this year. The most impressive back from Seattle this offseason has not been Rolls. It's not been CJ Procise and it hell no has not been Eddie Lacy. It has been this kid Chris Carson, the seventh round rookie. He's out of Oklahoma State. He opened the year as their RB4, but he has just been incredible in their preseason games. 
racking up receiving yards, racking up rushing yards. Last game, Proceis and Rawls were both out. Eddie Lacy started, but Chris Carson got in there immediately afterwards. And given the fact that Proceis and Rawls just cannot stay healthy, my strategy this year is to grab Thomas Rawls like I just did in the ninth or 10th round. And then in my one of my last, I'm not expecting one of the guys in my league. I, I'm in a savvy league, but I'm not in that much of a savvy league where Carson is going to be picked. It's only a 10 team league, but we since we do play two flexes and it's keeper, we have seven bench spots. So so the draft is pretty deep. It's like 17 rounds. So I think if I wait until like the 15th or 16th round, grab Carson. I have Rawls and Carson. And I think one of those two will end up being like the guy for Seattle. And whichever one it is, boom, that's a great keeper for me next year. So if you're one of those guys that wants to grab Rawls, also make sure you grab Carson in in like your last round. So that's um, that's where I'm at with Thomas Rawls. So now I have Peterson and Rawls on the bench, Watkins and Terrell Williams. I love Sproles this year. They're just keeping him in bubble wrap all preseason because they know that he's... He's their most valuable back right now. What I don't hate right now is Quiz in round 12 because he's the clear cut running back one in, in Tampa while Doug Martin is, you know, suspended for, you know, it's fucking crazy. Doug Martin went to rehab for Adderall. That's sh- most ridiculous shit I ever heard. That had to be the biggest PR stunt. I've. He might be the first person in the history of, of the world of Earth to go to rehab for Adderall. Bro, I don't know how many of you guys have taken Adderall. Actually, it's pretty addictive, but... You don't go to, I don't know. He got suspended for four games last year. And I guess, you know, it was all, it was, it was hundred percent PR, but it was all to hit his appeal just to be like, listen, I, I went to rehab. I changed as a man. And in last week's episode of hard knocks, he was like, I went through some hard times. If you go through some hard times, like you're shooting up heroin, you're not taking Adderall. You're out of your mind. Yeah. So quiz is going to be uh, the running back one while Doug Martin serves his jail sentence for Adderall. God, I'd be so fucked if I got drug tested for Adderall and he gets some easy matchups, the Dolphins, the Bears. And I can't remember who the week three matchup was. So he's going to be a high end RB2 for the first three weeks of the season. He played every single snap with the starters in their third preseason game. Charles Sims had one touch with the starters. That was it. So Quiz is clearly that guy. He averaged over 20 carries a game in the five games that he was their starter last year. I expect very similar numbers to that. So, you know, even if I don't feel comfortable, like my lineup to the right there, if I don't feel comfortable starting, you know, Peterson or Watkins in the first couple of weeks, Jack Quiz could easily, you know, just give me RB2 numbers for, for the beginning of the season. Now, I know his value takes a big hit when Martin comes back and it's arguably nothing it turns to. But Martin's, you know, shown over the last few years that he, he, re- he has trouble completing an entire season. So there's a decent chance at one point or another Quiz is back in the lineup as their RB1. It's not why I'm drafting him. I'm drafting him because you're getting a high-end RB2 for a quarter of your fantasy season i will pay a 12th round price to get high-end rb2 production for a quarter of 25 percent of your fantasy season i know it kind of sounds maybe ridiculous but that's that's how i picture it and i'm actually all for it now we got a lot we got three running backs on the bench two wide receivers oh come on don't be counting down on me i'll go with my homie legarrett blunt you know what while all y'all are sitting there hating that uh legarrett blunt all off season talking about how he doesn't look good he's gonna get cut he's overweight like one motherfucker he's been overweight like you knew that he's always been huge like you signed him to be your big back two they keep handing him outside stretch plays. You don't sign Big Papa Blunt to run to beat outside edge defenders. Like, that's on the Eagles coaching staff. That's not on Blunt. So, yeah, you can keep the Blunt getting cut rumors to yourself because the next day their coach came out and said Blunt's going to be a big part of this offense. He's still going to get the goal line touches. He's still going to get a ton of the early down work. And I don't know if any of you guys watched the Eagles play last last week in their, in their dress rehearsal week three preseason, but he had a couple runs that looked really good. I'm not ready to write Blunt off, man. Before ever, I know everyone's like, oh, Wendell Smallwood's going to be that guy. Blunt's out of the picture. I will believe it when I see it. So I don't mind taking Blunt in the 13th round. There's no downside. There's no risk to it. Look at all the guys that are going after him. I, I do like Darren Sproles and Pro Size, but the other guys I'm, I'm okay with. You can, you can miss me with that. Now is probably around the time when I'd look to probably snag Carson Palmer. Oh, wow. Even Big Ben is still on the board. This is why you always just got to go late quarterback. I like Rex Burkhead there. You can miss me with Kevin White times 1,000. You know what? I still think Rex Burkhead is the... I mean, this is when... Oh, you're not even going let to me, let me pick other flexes because I already... They're only letting me pick kickers and defensive players. But I guess that'll wrap up the video because I can't pick anyone else. But I would have probably grabbed Carson, Carson Palmer. Chris Carson would have been my next two. And then defense kicker would have rounded out my draft. In my draft also, like I said, anything past the eighth round is keeper territory so i probably wouldn't have grabbed garrett blunt there because he has no keeper value you know even if he has a a decent year this year 
you're not going to want to keep him next year, most likely. So I'd probably be picking other younger players with more upside in these later rounds rather than just like solid redraft depth. Anyways, uh, Burkhead, I, I like Burkhead as, as the best value. He's to me, he's like a Danny Wood. I wouldn't be surprised if they use him similar to Danny Woodhead. I know like James White and Deion Lewis are both great pass catching backs and Gillisley is supposed to get the, you know, the goal line work. But to me, Burkhead is really the only guy that could do everything. He's a really good pass catcher and he's good at running in between the tackles. He can run in the goal line rushes. So I'm okay taking a, a late round sleeper on, on Burkhead because, you know, when you're in the goal line, say you're within the five or the 10 yard line, put Burkhead in the shotgun and teams have no idea what you're doing. You could be handing him the ball. You could be throwing him a screen. Could be throwing and him just blocking. You put Gillisley in the backfield in the five yard line, like they are running the ball with him. If you put Deion Lewis or James White on the five yard line in the backfield, they are not running the ball with him. Burkhead's arguably the only guy that you can, you know, be confident and say that you don't, the defense is not going to know what you're actually doing with him in the backfield. And that, those are the type of players that the Patriots just, you know, that's how they win, man. That's why they're a dynasty. Kicker defense. Always go defense second to last round. Always go kicker last round. I'll take the the Vikings defense here. If I'm not getting one of like the top five defenses, one of the elite ones, then I do consider Minnesota as one of those. If I don't, you know, if I didn't get Minnesota there, I'd probably be looking at Buffalo. Uh, I look at the week one matchups and I see who I stream them week to week. I basically drop my defense every week, pick up a new one based on matchups, unless I have a good one. Buffalo has the Jets week one at home. So even if you think Buffalo sucks, like there's no way they give up more than like 14 points. So I'm cool with Buffalo week one. Kicker, same thing. If you're more of a beginner to fantasy football, the reason you do that is because kickers at the end of the year put up nearly the exact same, even their projections. Look at the projections. They're all going to finish within about 10 points of each other. So a one point difference on a per game basis. For you guys that are, that think you're cute picking Justin Tucker ahead, five rounds ahead of everyone else, you're not because Justin Tucker wasn't even kicker one last year. It was Matt Bryant. And as kicker two, Justin Tucker averaged probably a 1.2 points better than like kicker 15 so that's why because you're not getting an advantage at the position and those are rounds that you could use on you know like here like guys like jacquiz rogers who will give you solid numbers for a few weeks pick a kicker that's on a good offense they'll have a lot of opportunities to kick that's it anyways that wraps up the mock draft i would be very happy with the team i drafted here if that this was my my year-long redraft team it would be drew Brees at quarterback instead of luck and I would have Danny Woodhead on the bench instead of probably like set a quiz or maybe instead of Garrett Blunt, I have Danny Woodhead. So I'd be very happy with that. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave it down below. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed, if you learned something from your boy. And that's that. I will, I'll be bike next video. I don't know what it's going to be, but you know, I'll leave a comment down below for what, uh, what you'd like to see on the next couple videos. And maybe I'll try to get them out before all the drafts are done. So that's that. Big dogs out. Adios.